Now, what is a molecular orbital? That's the first thing you need to um, understand is the definition of a molecular orbital. And you have pretty good basis in atomic orbitals. You know there's S, P, D, and F atomic orbitals, and they're just for one atom. And, you know, that's an area in space, you know, a, a volume, so to speak, around the electron, I'm sorry, around the atomic nucleus where electrons are going to be, the probability of where you're going to find them. Well, molecular orbital is similar. It's also like an area in space that will be the probability of where the electrons will be in that molecule. And they're either going to be in a bond or they're not going to be in a bond, depending on how many electrons are involved. But right now, we're just looking at the ones that are in the bond. And they're similar. Remember, each, you know, an atomic orbital has a specific amount of energy. You know, S is lower in energy than P, which is lower energy than D, which is also lower in energy than F. Well, molecular orbitals also have specific energies which gives them that shape. And they have the same rules. You know, um, the off-ball rule is followed. That means the lowest energy orbitals are filled first. And Hund's rule is also followed, and so is the Pauli exclusion principle. You can only have two electrons in an orbital. They have to have opposite spin. And you have to put one in each orbital of equal energy before they start pairing. So all of those rules still exist and we're, I'm just going to try to explain this to you what they are. Give you a basic background with the hydrogen atom and if you put two hydrogen atoms together you're going to get hydrogen gas. It's H2. Both of those atoms have one electron in a 1s orbital. Lowest energy. And so Right here, this represents the um, hydrogen nucleus right there. And then the um, red area, the pink area around it, represents that s orbital where that one little electron is most likely to be found. And I have two of them here representing one hydrogen atom and then the second hydrogen atom. All right, now those two atoms, when they get together, get close enough, they will bond. And so if you can imagine them getting close and close and closer together, those orbitals, those s orbitals will overlap. Okay, and they can, and in this top example here, they're overlapping in a positive way, an additive way. They're adding together. And when that happens, you can look at the overall shape that is produced like this as an oval. This represents a bonding orbital. And remember, because this is end-to-end -end overlap, this is a sigma bonding orbital. And sigma is denoted with, well, it's just the Greek symbol sigma. I'll try to draw it there for you. Um, so this is an example of a sigma bonding orbital. Now what also can happen is if two hydrogen atoms get close enough together, you know, they can be subtractive. They can add in a negative way in which one is subtracted, so to speak, from the other. And you can think of them as like this hydrogen atom right here being um, positive and this hydrogen atom being negative and that's not an electrical charge that's just um, used to explain when you put them together they're going to cancel each other out. So you know from math that positive and negative numbers you know if you add positive one and negative one together they will cancel each other out. Well physicists talk about this as being they're either in phase or in different, like out of phase, like these two up here would be in the same phase, so they're added together. These two down here are out of phase, so to speak. This is in a different phase than this, and they end up canceling each other out when you add them together. You try to add them together, and instead of producing a nice big oval like this, the electrons, though this area right here, just kind of 
is subtracted. See the area of a uh, shaded area right here, instead of adding together, it's subtracted out. And so right here, that's called a node. It's kind of like that missing part that's, you know, destructive, so to speak, interference. It just gets canceled out. And electrons will not be found here. They won't be found in the node because that's just an area that's been canceled out. They can't exist there. So this type of orbital is still a sigma orbital, but it's called an anti-bonding orbital. And we put a little asterisk by it like this to say that it's anti-bonding. If electrons are in an anti-bonding orbital like this, they're going to exist over here and over here. They won't be in between the two atoms, so there's no bond that will form. So that is the difference between a bonding orbital like this up here and an anti-bonding orbital. And I'm going to pause just for a second and let you think about that. You know, contemplate on what I said. If you need to, pause the tape, rewind it, play it again. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. Now, I know you're asking, I know you're just itching to know what happens when you have atoms with enough electrons that they occupy some p orbitals. And when p orbitals overlap, you can get some pi bonding because uh, p orbitals can overlap side to side. And I've tried to d draw you some p orbitals here. So, um, and I'm using carbon. Carbon's a relatively small atom, and it has enough electrons to have some uh, p electrons. And, uh, you know, carbon is the whole basis of life and organic chemistry, so this is a good atom to look at. Now, this right here is one carbon atom and one p orbital right here. And this is the second carbon atom and a p orbital. And if they, those p orbitals, you can notice that I've got one lobe on each atom that's a little bit darker so that uh, you can see the difference in the lobes. And when they are additive, you know, when they combine in such a way that they're in phase and they are additive like this, you get a combination of this area on one lobe and this area on the other, adding together, and you get this pi bond, or this pi orbital. And we use the symbol for pi, to describe this molecular orbital. Okay, this is a pi bonding orbital right here. Now, if you look at the bottom example, you have this carbon atom with its two lobes of that p orbital and the second carbon atom. And notice, you know, I've colored these in, these, the lobes in a different color. This one is flipped. It looks like it just flipped. And so what that ha what happens is when they overlap, it's subtractive. It's kind of like, you know, destructive interference. It doesn't add, it subtracts. So this shaded area right here on both atoms, it gets eliminated. It's canceled out when they bond. And that forms this node between those two p orbitals like that. And so the electrons will not exist between those two atoms. They're only going to exist outside on the other side. So we call this a pi orbital, but it is an antibonding molecular orbital. And we use that little asterisk to denote that this is an antibonding orbital. Now, the thing that you have to remember about antibonding and bonding orbitals, no matter if you're looking at sigma, 
like in the hydrogen atom, sigma, or you're looking in the carbon atom, you know, that has pi electrons, at the pi, the antibonding orbitals are lower in, I'm sorry, the antibonding orders are higher in energy. So this one right here is called a destabilized orbital because it is higher in energy than the individual atoms atomic orbitals. It is higher in energy. Now the bonding orbital is a stabilizing this um, pi bonding orbital is a stabilizing molecular orbital. That means that it is lower in energy. This, this one right here is lower in energy than the two individual ones. And as you know, atoms always want to have the lowest amount of energy they can. That's why they bond, is to lower their potential energy. And if the electrons can achieve this bonding orbital, it is lower in energy. And that's why it produces a, a, a stable bond. It stabilizes the molecule, or those two atoms. And this one, if you have electrons here, it is destabilizing.